Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, King Jesus. This morning we want to continue talking along the lines that we've been on for the last few sessions. Who remembers the title of the message? And they went forth. That's correct. And they went forth. A phrase that's taken from one of the Gospels where in the closing moments of Jesus' life on earth in physical form, he's got his disciples gathered together, doesn't he? And he commissions them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He then ascends to the right hand of the Father, and the Bible records that they, in obedience to what they had been told, they went forth, didn't they? And disciples in every age do that. Because we reckon with God, his command, his authority over our lives, his instruction to us to go as the original disciples went, the 12, the 70, then followers of Jesus. We've taken a few minutes and talked about how disciples are disciple makers, aren't they? So we go and we make other followers of Jesus who will in turn make other followers of Jesus. Thankfully to this day, that's what's been going on in the church. Amen? That's why we're here. Because people in previous generations took seriously God's call upon their lives to tell other people about the good things that the Lord had done for them. Let's be faithful in our generation. Amen? We've talked about having been commissioned. We, we, <clears throat> we recognize that an effective witness springs from ultimately God and the heart of God. But among the truths that would direct us toward uh, effectively, consistently sharing the gospel with people would be those that speak to God having commanded us. He tells us to do <clears throat> uh, as he has done, as the disciples did, and we in obedience, in humble submission to it, Jesus his lordship, we go. We've talked some about having a compassion on the lost, like Jesus has. Amen? Not just had, but has. God still loves the world. Amen? God still is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's his heart, and he makes it our heart. He gives us a desire to see souls saved. If you're here this morning and you think, well, oh yeah, that's right, I'm supposed to have a desire to see souls saved, ask God to stir it in you. Make more real to you the good things that the Lord has done for you. You know, sometimes, all I say sometimes, all too often, Christians come to a relationship with the Lord in some kind of a distress. Uh, they're, 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 they're troubled, and, and in some way they, they are brought to a place of reckoning with their need for the saving life of Jesus Christ. Well, after that, life starts getting good, a lot better than it was. Not perfect. Doesn't all go, uh, you know, we don't... Just, we're not raptured out immediately. We've got an assurance of our salvation. We've got peace in our hearts. We know that we're accepted by God, and life gets better, and all too often Christians revert to uh, old ways and interest in the things of this world. They've dealt with the, the unsettled, uh, the, the, the troubling soul. They've been reconciled to God. And that's great. But failing to be careful, prudent, circumspect, they get drugged down, entangled with the things of this life, don't they? And as a consequence, they lose some of the joy of their salvation. And they're not as mindful as they need to be, and I say they, we, are not as mindful of, as we need to be of the precious truths that pertain to God's care for us. Uh, Jesus being the gift of God through whom and only through whom a soul can be saved. A soul, uh, the, the, the worst of sinners can be forgiven of their sins. Isn't that glorious? And we would testify personally of having been dead and lost and bound and blind and, and God in his mercy reaching out to us, bringing us to himself. We did not seek him, he sought us out. Drew us to himself. Under some circumstances, those truths seem to be a little bit more real and more present, more prominent in our thinking, uh, more precious to us. And as a consequence, we talk more about them. But if that's not the case today, then return to your first love. 
Stir yourself up. Get closer to God. Crack open your Bible and read of the wonderful things that the Lord has done for you. The precious promises that are, are, your, that are yours in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And then you may find yourself moving in a greater compassion toward the lost and being more compelled to speak, can't help but speak of the things which you've seen and heard. You've been reminded of them. And you know how lost the lost really are. It's more real to you. Because God, by his spirit, has made it more real to you. And so we speak more freely. Amen? Well, we talked about not being afraid. Talked about you don't have to be afraid. God didn't give you that kind of spirit, did he? No. You don't have to be afraid because the worst that a man can do to you, that human beings can do, is, is kill you. All they can do is kill your body. But they can't take, take your soul, can they? So we talked a bit about not being afraid. And we also talked about how God commands us not to be afraid. Don't consider it optional. Don't think you can just think, well, I'm, I'm just a little bit more timid. I'm a little bit more uh, uh, quiet. I'm not the outgoing uh, uh, type. I, I'm not very good with words or very good around strangers. And God says, don't say that. Don't say I'm a child. And, and what he's saying is what? Don't make excuses. Don't think you're the exception. Disciples are called to go and to preach. No exceptions. If you've been saved, you've been commissioned. So we looked, at, we looked at fear from that perspective too, didn't we? Yep. Thou shalt not. Don't be afraid. Don't say and make some excuse for yourself. Amen? And then we talked a little bit about persecution and rejection. Because we want to understand this is, as we've said now... <clears throat> This is not some tutorial in how to share the gospel. We're, we're, looking at a number of <clears throat> we're, we're looking at a number of related truths, truths that are related to sharing the gospel, that are related to Christianity and our sharing the gospel, sharing Christianity with others. And among the truths that are spoken of that pertain to being Christians and sharing the gospel are truths that pertain to rejection and persecution. So don't think it's strange. God wants us to know that as we go, we'll be in good company. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. Amen? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Uh, the servant is not greater than his master. So you'll, you'll be hated of all men for the name of Jesus' sake. And that's just, we're forewarned, aren't we? We're warned. Because the natural tendency sure would be to think that, hey, I'm, I'm you know, just really uh, going beyond myself and reaching out to these people, total strangers sometimes, and I'm, 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 into, I'm out of my comfort zone, but I'm doing so for the love of Jesus, for the cause of Christ, and, uh, and to see this soul saved, out of a genuine care to see this soul saved. I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I'm out on, the, out on the, uh, the, the fringes of what I, I feel comfortable and confident in doing, but I'm doing it as a Christian, is under the, the Lord and for his glory. And then somewhere in the back of our minds, we think that, well, because we're really pressing out there in faith, we're going to see this marvelous harvest of souls. And they'll mock you, ridicule you. The, the, the last thing you needed to hear when you feel like you're, okay, man, I'm really going to step out in faith and do this thing, Somebody just laugh in your face. <laughs> you were looking for a little encouragement, affirmation. Uh, you know, somebody says, wow, I'm so glad that you came to tell me about Jesus Christ. I've been praying and crying out that the Lord would help me know. And, and you're the Lord's anointed vessel that has been sent. And wouldn't we love to hear those kinds of things? That would be great encouragement at our times when we're really out there, you know, just really uh, uh, feeling as though mm, we're... we're, we're Trying hard to be bold and, and courageous. And, uh, and uh, all too often it doesn't go that way. No thanks. No. Not interested. Nope. Not, not interested in talking about religion. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, keep your Jesus. Uh, what? Jesus? Come on. Get real. Can we see him? Can we touch him? Can we? You know, then he's not real. And any, any, anybody that believes that's a fool. I told you, man, this guy, this drunk that Marianne and I were talking with, um, 
Oh, we were on the trail down there in uh, <clears throat> near the, uh, the New River in West Virginia and, and uh, having a conversation with this guy and he just, <clears throat> just boldly says, anybody believes that God's a fool? <laughs> Let me tell you about the God who I believe, who, who I know made you, made me, made these beautiful, you know, waterfalls and trees and things that you say you love so much, that God, and he says, anybody believes that stuff's a fool? <laughs> You'd take another run or two at it, and, and uh, I hope that I, I trust that fool, that fool. Because <laughs> the Bible says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Amen? Amen? I'm not the fool for believing in God. He's the fool for saying that God doesn't exist. God was rich in mercy, extended to that man an opportunity. And so for the 10 or 15 minutes we were walking with him on the trail, <laughs> he just repeatedly called me a fool. But wanted to continue the conversation, oddly enough. You're reminded of those things. Yep. Yep. No. Uh, obviously, people who lie against the truth are really trying to convince themselves, aren't they? That what they know to be true is not true. That's a tough fight. That's a tough fight. So this guy resorted to the wilderness and to the bottle to try to find answers to life and God and his mercy. He sent a couple of Christians along his path to tell him about the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. As we were finishing up on Wednesday, we were talking about powerful truth. Powerful truth. And of course, we went over to Hebrews chapter, say it with me, four. Okay? Hebrews chapter 4. You know that, right? If I start quoting the passage of Scripture, for the Word of God is alive and powerful, quick and powerful, depending on what, what translation you're using. It's alive. It's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the Word of God. That a Christian speaks when they tell somebody about their need for salvation, that they must be born again, that Jesus Christ died for their sins. That's the word of God. Christ died for your sins. That's right there in the book of Corinthians, isn't it? Christ died for your sins according to the gospel. Ye must be born again. Marvel not that I said unto you, red letters, the Bible says, ye must be born again. You're speaking words that God has spoken. Jesus and his word are one. And the, Jesus elsewhere, there in John's gospel, says the words that I speak unto you are spirit. You're not just speaking your philosophy, as you know. But I remind us today of that. <clears throat> Probably in part because I'm helped by being reminded. These words, I'm encouraged by God's spirit. When I'm sharing the gospel with somebody or when I've, you know, finished up an opportunity, taken some time with them, I go away and I remember the words that I spoke are spirit words. And I believe, as you do, that the Holy Spirit takes those words and he uses them to bring about a discerning in the heart of, of that soul. That they could have some illumination that would help them sort out their thoughts from the voice of God who is convicting them of their need to repent and believe the gospel. The entrance of God's word brings light. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It brings sufficient illumination that a soul could come to grips with the folly and vanity of their own philosophy the emptiness and worthlessness of the things that they thought were precious into a conviction that they're not right before their maker. And they need to open up their hearts and lives to God's forgiveness and, and the saving life of Jesus Christ. God does that work by his word, the gospel. Is there any work more powerful and more profound I mean, how does, uh, you know, seeing a, a mountain plucked up and cast into these, the sea compare to the fine, intricate, and eternal work that God does by his word in a soul, in a human soul, bringing about an illumination and hopefully a regeneration? 
Amen? That a soul could be saved. Passed from death unto life. You preach the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Alive and powerful. Amen? I brought along a couple more scriptures on that point before we move on. And I do so, I trust you understand why I do so. I, you know, I just felt there was a little bit more to say on the subject. And I know that many of you are careful about taking notes and writing down these references and reviewing them. That the Holy Spirit could strengthen you in these truths. We're interested in seeing the saints equipped to do the work of the ministry. Amen? So turn with me. <clears throat> Let me get my... This is interesting. Oh, this is interesting. Mm, I might be sending somebody on an errand here. Uh -huh. This is very interesting. Uh, I don't think I got my notes with me. Yeah, they're probably on the on the the desk or the the island in the kitchen. <laughs> yep. See, I've got I've got last Sunday's notes with me, and I've got Wednesday notes with me. <clears throat> But I don't have today's notes with me. I brought, I got a lot of good ones. I'm sure there's nothing over there that I left. Is there, Marianne? What'd you do with them, Marianne? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll visit the, the passages of scripture. Uh, bear with me until we uh, have notes back in hand. But <clears throat> the, the scripture... Uh, tells us of Jesus there in John 6. Uh, and you could go with me there. In John 6, Jesus is preaching, you know, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the Bible records that it <clears throat> uh, uh, causes the people of God to murmur. <clears throat> And you could look with me down to verse 66 of John 6. The Bible says that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They found that the, the saying of eat my flesh and drink, drink my blood was too hard to hear. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. When you preach, you have words of eternal life that you are speaking. And that is the objective. Remember that we're not trying to win an argument or convince somebody to be a part of our club or that we're right and they're wrong, you speak words, the words that are of eternal life, that have the capacity, the power, to bring about a resurrection or a regeneration. We must be mindful of, of this. What, what a strength and encouragement, what a, a confidence it puts in your witness when you know and understand and believe that you're speaking words that have the power to bring about newness of life. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> I'm tempted to start serving coffee or something like that. <laughs> Intermission. <clears throat> you could go with me over to Ephesians chapter 2. Thanks much, James. Where were they? Table. Table. There you go. Thanks. 
Uh, before you go to Ephesians chapter 2, go to Acts chapter 2. We talk of powerful truth. <clears throat> this is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. And again, as Peter's preaching, we know that thousands are saved in those early sessions, aren't they? And yep, yeah, just a reminder, uh, won't always be uh, that kind of in-gathering when you're sharing the gospel. But <clears throat> just look at how the word of God affects these souls. We'll pick it up at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And verse 37 reads, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what must we do? That's that sword of the spirit, isn't it? The sword of the spirit. The scripture in more than one place depicts Jesus coming with the, as one out of whose mouth comes a sword. His word cuts, cuts deep, doesn't it? It cuts to the heart. The word of God cuts to the heart. Be mindful of that. Be confident of that. The devil will try to get you discouraged in your witnessing. The devil will tell you that was no, uh, of no value, of no profit. They went away. They weren't interested in hearing. They, uh, they opposed what you had to say. He may, the devil may try to tell you that you didn't do a very good job of sharing the gospel. You should have used more verses or other verses. You should have been quicker with, uh, with uh, this reference or that one. Don't listen to the devil. That's not coming from the Holy Spirit, is it? The Holy Spirit is there to encourage you and to take the words that you've shared and anoint them and bring about a conviction so that the people are cut to the heart. They won't necessarily tell you that they're cut to the heart, but you know that what you have shared is alive. And it goes past their brain and into the soul, into their heart. Remember that. Truth is alive and powerful. Amen? Of course, in verse 40, it says, with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. Some will be ready to receive. Some will have ears to hear. Turn with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's the word that you're preaching. Got that? But after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth. We're talking about truth. And uh, the, the, the Christian goes preaching the truth of the gospel. They go with the word of God upon their lips in its truth. There will be those who stop their ears. They turn away from the truth. They will not endure it. But you, and, and that, that's the response, <clears throat> not just to a philosophy, but to something that really poked them in the eye, so to speak. It got their attention, didn't it? Because you are preaching the truth. The truth. What they need to hear, but they not, might not be ready to hear. Not, might not be willing to hear. But what you know, they must hear if they are to be saved. Go with me to one more on this, this subject. And that is found in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. In verse 17, it reads, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Do we want people to have 
faith in Jesus Christ? This passage is a passage that says, how shall they hear unless somebody tells them? Amen? Amen. How shall they hear? Because faith comes by hearing. The faith to believe in God, to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it comes by the word of God. That's the objective. You're out there to share truth with somebody, to preach the gospel, to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. You share living truth with them. And faith, God gives people an opportunity at such a time to place their trust in Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not just a, you know, a, a, a walk. I get closer to God uh, just by going out into the woods or into the mountains. Or I get closer to God when I just go out on the, the boat away from all the hustle and bustle and just get to hear the, the, the lap of the waves against the, the hall and I just, you know, the gentle rock and I just get quiet and calm. And No, no, no. You might get away from the little hustle and bustle and might catch a fish even. <laughs> but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you preach the word. Amen? Amen. 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 <clears throat> Let's take a look at a couple passages of scripture that deal with uh, preaching with authority. Go with me back over to the book of Acts. This time Acts chapter 4. And we'll read from verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. That's where our, our power and authority comes from. Amen? You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit. And that's not authority. You know, in the King James Version, power is sometimes the, the word, the English word power, is sometimes referring to the Greek word that really speaks of authority. Other times, it's power, power. Dunamis, like dynamite. The, word, the Greek word from which we would get our word, dynamite. Here, excuse me, in the book of Acts 1, you shall receive power. That's, that's dunamis. That's power. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Well, here, Peter is filled with the Holy Ghost, isn't he? He's been preaching the gospel, people getting saved, people getting healed, and, and also people getting arrest, arrested. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, that this man stand here before you whole. This stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Well, he's really getting it to him, isn't he? He's making a direct reference to a prophetic word that they would be familiar with. The stone which was set at naught of you builders has become the head of the cornerstone, the, the head of the, the, the edifice, the chief cornerstone. And he's saying, you're the ones that did that. You're the ones that rejected the cornerstone. You've rejected the Messiah. And he's saying, there is salvation in no other name. He's saying, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Not Yahweh. They put a lot of emphasis on Moses, didn't they? Yep, they sure did. They loved Moses. Peter's telling them salvation is in Jesus Christ. Salvation in no other name. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Well, if you've been with Jesus, you'll walk in some boldness. When he's baptized you with his Holy Spirit and fire, You'll preach with a confidence, with an assurance of who you are in him 
and that what you're saying is the truth, that Jesus Christ is indeed the only hope of salvation. You preach with authority. You know what you're talking about. The best the, that the unsaved man has is an argument, a philosophy. You have truth. And you say so. You preach like you know what you're talking about. Because you do. And though they can look you right in the eye, and they can, their, their faces can be like those uh, adamant stones, they can be set and determined against you, you don't back down. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you preach as one having authority. Because you've been sent by God. And you've been given his living word. Amen? Look with me over to Acts chapter 3. Just, just back. Now often, these words <clears throat> are recorded under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. First word, what is it? Acts 3.19. Repent. This is in the imperative. This is a command. You're telling people they need to change the way they think. It's not just a, oh, you know, don't you want to consider an alternative to the way you've been living? Don't you want to think about maybe uh, doing something to make your life a little bit better? No. Tell people God commands them to repent. Don't make it wishy-washy. People don't need wishy-washy. They need truth. You know it. Present it like you believe it. Present it like you believe it. With authority. Repent and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. With that phrase, he puts it into context, doesn't he? What we're talking about is the culmination of the plan of God since the very beginning. That God would send his only begotten son into the world as a redeemer, as a savior. I preach to you salvation through the person of Jesus Christ. Can you say those kinds of things? Can you speak those kinds of words authoritatively? Like you really believe them? Like you are convinced, convinced and convicted that there is no hope for any soul apart from the person of Jesus Christ? That's the way, to, that's the way we are to preach. With authority. You don't have to shout. Veins don't have to be popping out in your neck and in your forehead. Don't have to be spitting and frothing. But you're speaking plain truth directly. As one having authority. Because you do have authority. You've been authorized by God Almighty. He having commissioned you has authorized you to preach this message. Present it that way, like these men do. Perceived by the educated and the elite to be foolish and ignorant men. They weren't formally educated, were they? But they had been with Jesus. Had been commanded by him and authorized by him to preach this message and they weren't backing down. Nope, on the contrary, they were ready to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, nose to nose with any of them. And they did so with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They spoke as those having authority. That's the way the gospel ought to be presented. This is not a message. Again, we, we live in a culture where in a uh, just under the influence of the devil, there are all kinds of religious people that are trying to gather in other people to be other religious people like themselves. 
we're not interested in just making more religious people, more church attendees. We're interested in converts to the cross of Jesus Christ. Converts to the cross. We tell people that Christianity is not just about feeling good, feeling better, having a happy and sunny day. We tell people that if you want your sins to be forgiven, if you want to know that you don't go to hell when it's done in this life, but you can have a living relationship with the living God, God will be your father, you can be his son, his daughter, then you need to deny yourself and take up your cross on a daily basis and start following Jesus. Repent. Change the way you think. Change the way you think about who you are. Definitely change the way you, you think about religion. Devil's been effective at packaging and promoting a pretty perverted form of religion, of Christianity. Religion, pure, James, pure religion and undefiled form. Religion in and of itself isn't necessarily evil, but you know what I'm referring to when I talk about religion. I'm talking about man's perversion and corruption of the truth. A repackaging and a corrupt, of a corrupted form and it's, it's so prevalent. And a lot of the preaching that we do is preaching against that. Identifying the error of false religion. So that people could recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Who've been taken captive by him at his will to do his will. <clears throat> A couple more. You don't need to turn to them. I'm going to give them to you for your notes. Again, just... Uh, the call to repentance. Change the way you think. You need to think differently. Acts 20, 21 and 20, uh, excuse me, Acts 20, verses 20 and 21, where the Apostle Paul says, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We find here, as he's encouraging the Ephesian elders, uh, sort of a, a summary, a capsulization of, uh, of, of the approach that he took. He taught them repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That plain, that simple. Repent and believe the gospel. And you present that message as one having authority. Can somebody get saved apart from this message? Hmm. That ought to serve to underscore the importance of keeping it pure, keeping it plain, keeping it direct, keeping it forthright, authoritative. Don't leave somebody with the notion that you are less than convinced of what you're telling them. Or that you in any way think that there are alternatives that their philosophy is as good as your philosophy. You know, people have all got these different ways and there are so many different religions and we've all got our different beliefs and, well, I want to tell you what I believe. No, you're not just telling them what you believe, you're telling them that they need to believe what you believe. You got that? You're not just, you know, because people want to tell you sometimes what they believe. They'll share with you their perspective, won't they? Well, this is what I think, and this is the way I was brought up, and what about this, and, and aren't these people over there, you know, who do this this way? And, and they say, well, this is what I believe. Well, that's pulling up short of a, of a plain presentation of repent. When you tell somebody repent, you're telling them they need to change the way they think. You do not want them going away thinking that it's okay as far as you're concerned, if they believe what they believe, just be, just believe, just believe, right? Be apostrophe, L-I-E-V-E, -E, right? Believe. Those Baltimoreans. <laughs> Baltimoreanians are. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the condition of the lost. 
the condition of the lost. This is also uh, important for us to have clear in our understanding, clear in our minds where they are. They're not seeking God. They're not basically good, just need a little help along the way, a little nudge in the right direction. We need to have in, in our minds a clear understanding of who, who people really are in their, in their most essential nature. You with me there? Because <clears throat> if we fail to have a proper understanding uh, of, of the condition of the lost, their state, their, their, their nature, we are not going to effectively present the message as it needs to be presented. It would be like a, uh, you know, a sick person going to the doctor and the doctor just recommending, uh, you know, uh, uh, get, some, get some rest and in, in, uh, fresh air. Well, rest and fresh air is good, isn't it? Yeah. But it's not real specific. And maybe the person goes on in there, well, you know, they got a broken arm or something like that. Or they've got some operable cancer the doctor should be able to identify and deal with. But if he fails to take the time, make the effort, if he doesn't know the nature of the need, you with me there? Then how effective is he going to be at his prescription? So Christians need to have a clear understanding. You think, well, yeah, they're, they're sinners. Yeah, okay, I, I, I know that. You know that, and I know you know that. But we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Because even though we know it, and the Bible says it, we don't always act that way. Which really gives testimony to us, maybe not knowing it as solidly as we need to know it. Some of you uh, have acquaintances or family members and you have to shake your, oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're of their father the devil. But they're so nice. Oh yeah, that's right, they're of their father the devil. And, the less, and there's this conflict in the way we perceive them, isn't there? Yep. So let's get it straight in our minds and do our best by the grace of God. Keep it cl uh, clear and straight in our minds. The condition of the lost. Who they are, who they are not, what they are like. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We'll start out with some real familiar ones. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no. Say it with me. No. Not one. No, not one. None righteous. Yes, I am talking about your mama. <laughs> None righteous. No, not one. None that understands. There's none that seeks after God. But I know some people that are, you know, God's drawing them. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. None that doeth good. But I know some people that do good. They do, don't do good all the time. They're not born again, but they're, they're good people. That's why we're talking on this subject. Yeah. Yeah. They don't do good. Because the Bible says there is none that doeth good. No, not one. And that's the way we have to view people. We've got people that are unsaved, do-gooders. Some of you here today probably still reckoning with that um, and trying to get that sorted out in your own mind because you were one of those good people. You used to do good. Oh, you weren't born again yet, but you used to do good. And, um, and uh, in so saying, you're saying that you don't have the proper understanding of what the Bible has to say regarding your condition as a lost soul. You didn't do good. Oh, but I did. Then you don't believe what the Bible has to say. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Apart from God, no, there's none good but one. That is God. Amen? Go with me over to Ephesians chapter 2. 
We'll be back to Romans, I assure you. But go with me next over to Ephesians chapter 2. Who are these people? What is their condition? What are they like in their nature? Some of you are married to these people. Some of you, these are your sons and your daughters. I'm talking about your moms. I'm talking about your dads. I'm talking about your sons. I'm talking about your daughters. I'm talking about your husbands. I'm talking about your wives. I'm talking about your grandmothers and your aunts and uncles. I'm talking about your, your childhood friends. I'm talking about these people. We are talking about these people in the light of the scripture. So he says from verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So he's writing to the, the, the saints at Ephesus. And he says, you. Uh, 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 who is he talking to? Well, everybody that's part of the church at Ephesus. All the born again people there. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Anybody that's been born again didn't get born again from birth. They got born again from new birth, rebirth. And you have he quickened, made alive, who were dead. You were dead, now you're alive. Where in times past, you walked according to the course of this world. When you were dead, you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? That's the devil, Satan. You walk doing his will? Yeah. You read over in the Gospels, Jesus says to the, these, these religious leaders, you are of your father, the devil. And, uh, and I trust you all know that it's one or the other. No middle ground. No other parentage. Got it? Either God's your father or the devil's your father, according to scripture. Oh, boy, that just sounds harsh. That's why we're talking about these things. Because nobody should sit here today and think, oh, that sounds harsh. That just means, oh, that's, that's helpful to know. That's the way the, the, that's what the response should be. Amen? That's, what, that's the way we should be responding to truth. Oh, Mm, that's important to know. If that's what the Bible says, has to say, that's the way I want to think. If you're not thinking along those lines, then I would say one thing to you. Repent. Change the way you think. Change the way you think. <clears throat> In times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who is he referring to as the children of disobedience? The people that aren't saved yet. The people that are not born again. That are of their father the devil and the lust of their father they do. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. In the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath even as others. All of us. Um, regardless of how good you were before you came to Jesus. You know, you know, I, I know you. You're all pretty good people. <clears throat> pretty good, nice people, kind people. You were by nature children of wrath, even as others. The other people, the bad people. That's what we're talking about here, right? Even as others, because our tendency would be to make some distinction between ourselves and other people. And God says, no, no. Nope. We were, we were all children of wrath, just like the other people. So you, uh, you think of the worst that you run into or have heard about, and you are in the same boat. And all that don't know Jesus are in that same condition. They're lost. They're dead. Alienated from God by their wicked works. You go to a cemetery, okay? And there are, there are um, places where bodies have been buried. Okay? Okay. Is anybody in that cemetery more dead than anybody else? Well, that grave, that says, you know, n you know 1947. <laughs> Careful, Sam. We're not trying to... <laughs> we're not planning on burying you today there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that one dates back to 1968. So is the guy that's been in the, in the ground, the body that's been in the ground since 47, more dead? You're just dead. Good there? Okay, we got that cleared up. You as you quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, which is all the unsaved people. The prince of the power of the air is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, works in the unsaved. Among whom also we all had our conversation. That means I too was walking according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit of the prince of the power of the air worked in me. And it continues to work in the unsaved, among whom we all had our conversation, that is our lifestyle in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So people are going about fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and yet, because in church circles, we make some, we have some tendency to make a distinction. Lust is sexual lust. And, uh, and, and, and when Christians don't do that anymore, don't give place to sexual lust anymore, and that's a bad thing to do. And lust is not limited to sexual lust. Uh, lust comes in all kinds of forms. It's just an insatiable desire. And... Uh, it takes on, yeah, it just takes on all kinds of different forms, doesn't it? So we, were, we, we, we one had a desire for, sure, sexual gratification, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, like the, the, the dead rocker, you can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> right? Yeah, no satisfaction in this world. And uh, God in his mercy has brought us to that realization. New stuff doesn't satisfy. More stuff doesn't. The bigger and better doesn't satisfy. No, nope, doesn't satisfy. Only Jesus does. But we went about in our own different ways. We just wanted it a little bit nicer, a little bit newer, a little fresher, a little bit more exciting. We were just looking for something that would gratify us. We went about seeking to fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Nobody around you would have thought you were just bound in lust just controlled by some all-consuming passion for more of this, or just bound in the avarice and greed and, and, uh, and or, you know, sexual drives and desires. No, nobody would have characterized you like that. But still, you went about fulfilling the desires of the, uh, endeavoring to fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Right? Yeah. And that's where everybody who doesn't know Jesus is still. They're just pursuing their own will, their own interests. You know that. And you know that only Jesus satisfies. And the emptiness and the, the, the lack of direction that, that people struggle with and the hopelessness that people have to contend with, you know, that you may have tried this and it really didn't satisfy. I'm going to try harder and go further and get more. And, and you know what they're dealing with because that's where you once lived. And you've come to know Jesus, who is life. He's the prince of life. And you've come to know life more abundantly in him. But you know that these people who don't know him are still going about fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And yes, as a consequence, they are by nature children of wrath, even as others. Ephesians chapter 4, just go over a couple chapters. We've got a few more minutes. We'd be a little further ahead if Marianne hadn't left my notes at home. Here in Ephesians chapter 4, look at me down to verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, you have not so learned Christ. So uh, we're not to walk like we used to walk is, is the point that he's making here, isn't it? But then he, he takes the opportunity to talk about what we used to walk like and how the Gentiles still walk, how they still live, how they still uh, do what they do, having their understanding darkened, really, really a description of their, their state or condition, not just their conduct, having their understanding darkened alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. They're ignorant because they are blind. They're blind because they've closed their eyes to the truth. 
This is an ignorance, not because of a lack of opportunity, but it is because of a willful rejection of the truth. This is not a blindness and an ignorance because nobody ever told them they didn't know. We've already covered that. The invisible things of, the cre of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Amen? And in this world, our, our you know, 21st century America, uh, a lot of people have, have heard at least bits and pieces of the gospel message, the name of Jesus. And if they're ignorant, it's because they choose to be ignorant. Nope, don't want to think about that. Don't want to do anything about, yeah, from time to time I think about the condition of my soul that I might, you know, might want to know that if there is a God, if I really determine, you know, whether I really do believe in God, and if there is a God there, you know, what it takes to get to heaven. I think about those things from time to time, and I appreciate the conversation, but uh, I'm busy right now, and I'm not going to think any more about it. And here you are talking with them about the most important consideration that could ever be put before them. They're eternal souls. And they say, uh, not right now. I'm busy. Well, that's a ignorance. And it's a willful ignorance. And it's a blindness, a willful blindness. You'd like to teach them. You'd like to explain to them. You'd like to talk to them truth. But they say, mm, no, not interested. That's where people are. Go with me to one more. One more. <clears throat> Titus chapter 3. We'll take some more time on this this afternoon because I want us to uh, have it uh, freshly fixed in our hearts and minds. The condition of the lost. But here in Titus chapter 3, we read from verse 3, For we ourselves... Now, the third person, right? We're including us in this. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of, our, uh, of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. This is where we all were. And maybe part of the, the exercise of coming to an understanding of the condition of the lost is reckoning with where we were and who we were before we came to Jesus Christ. Did you hear what I just said? Maybe part of really what we're talking about when we talk about coming to grips with the condition of the lost or coming to a, a fuller and, and more clear, more solid understanding of the condition of the lost is really coming to grips with who we were before we came to Jesus, our condition before we came to Jesus. We were uh, poor and miserable, wretched, blind, naked. We were deceived and being deceived, hateful and hating one another. That's who we were selves, ourselves were. And yeah, we don't like to think of ourselves that way necessarily, but again, if, we don't, if we're not, not reckoning with the truths of the scripture regarding our condition then we're probably not perceiving the lost biblically, accurately. And as a consequence, the message isn't presented appropriately. They're not hearing what they need to hear because we're less than convinced of the seriousness of their condition. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds. Let's do some repenting ourselves. Amen? Change the way we think about, about lost people. <clears throat> Dead and alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness that they move in. It's a blindness because of disinclination, not for lack of opportunity. Remember that. Remember to preach the word authoritatively. Amen? Amen. And remember that the word of God is alive and powerful. Have a confidence in the working of God's word, the work of God's Holy Spirit in hearts and in lives as you share. And yep, go in the power of the Holy Spirit as well. Allow him to 
anoint you and use you for his glory. Amen? Let's bow before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you. We bless your name, Lord God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. There's salvation in no other, no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved, Jesus. That name that's above every name. Do help us to preach that name and preach the gospel message. And with the authority that you have commissioned us with, command men to repent and to believe the gospel that they might be saved. Help us, O Lord God. We ask in Jesus' name. Thank you, O Lord. Let's stand together and worship the Lord together as we finish this morning. We're to be those who follow hard after Jesus. Hallelujah. Help us to follow hard after you at all times, O Lord God. Teach us to be effective ministers of this gospel, able ministers of this gospel, workers together with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Lord bless you all. Be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord. God's grace and peace go with you. <laughs>